hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech 24. I'm Julia Seeger. Living to tell the tale, NASA's unmanned spacecraft Cassini has survived the first of 22 planned plunges between the rings of Saturn, snapping mind-blowing pictures of the planet's atmosphere. And in Test 24, we'll tell you how 3D printers are radically changing the speed and cost of humanitarian relief by instantly creating supplies needed on the ground. But first, the Cassini mission is wrapping up its 13-year probe of Saturn's system. The mission's grand finale recently kicked off with the spacecraft's first of 22 planned plunges between the planet itself and its inner icy rings, highly challenging flybys of the planet that have already revealed its extraordinary features. This comes before the unmanned aircraft conducts its very last dive into Saturn's atmosphere on September 15th. Shirley Sitbon has the story. In Cassini's tanks, fuel is running out. NASA's spacecraft will soon crash into Saturn, the planet it has explored for 13 years. But before it does, Cassini has a mission to accomplish, one of the most complicated ever launched, diving into the narrow gap between Saturn and its rings 22 times. Its speed, 124,000 kilometers per hour, in an area likely to be filled with ice particles. We're getting close to the end of the journey, so scientists can take more risks. It's risky to fly the spacecraft between Saturn, an enormous planet, and its rings. This will allow to gather more scientific data and beautiful pictures. Here are some of the unprocessed pictures taken during the first grand finale dive. We've never seen Saturn so up close. Swirling clouds, a massive hurricane, and an odd weather system. The mission will soon be over, but scientists have a lot they want to find out before it does. What's under Saturn's cloud surface? They want Cassini to explore the planet's winds, aurora's gravity, its magnetic field, and how fast it rotates. After studying the planet's 62 known moons, Cassini is expected to photograph several which are small and located closest to the planet. And it's time to welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cavalcar. Hello, Dan. Hello, Julia. Tell us more about these moons. They could harbor life. That's incredible. Well, that's right. Because of the Cassini mission, we now have a better understanding of the two moons, Enceladus and Titan. So much so that now we believe, or the scientists believe, that they hold the most uh, or the greatest potential for harboring early forms of life. So that is Enceladus. Now, what uh, Cassini has done is it has uh, orbited around Enceladus. Cassini is not only just a single mission, there was another probe called Huygens probe, which landed on the surface of Titan, and it found that Titan consists of uh, ice and liquid methane. Now, in, in, for Enceladus, uh, the Cassini spacecraft, it passed through the plumes, you know, uh, Enceladus, it emits these towering jets of ice and water vapor, and the, uh, the spacecraft passed through them, and it detected hydrogen molecules, which are a good indicator for early forms of life. So that's why these two moons are quite exciting. And besides this, uh, uh, besides this aspect, uh, the moons were very important because the Cassini spacecraft, it did number of flybys around Titan. Flyby essentially is, uh, it's, it's like a harnessing of gravity. So gravity pulls in this spacecraft like a slingshot. And once it goes around the, the uh, moon, in this case, Titan, it accelerates. So you get the acceleration required. So if, you're, if, you, have a, if you have this mission, which is, it's a lost deep space mission which is on limited fuel, then these flybys are very important to keep it uh, in a sustenance mode. So that's why these moons also played a very important role. And now why are we crashing Cassini? Well, for the in the, these two moons, as I mentioned, they could be harboring life. Uh, scientists, they don't want uh, the spacecraft to, uh, to contaminate these moons. And why will they contaminate, why will the spacecraft contaminate these moons? Because as I mentioned earlier, it's now running low on fuel. It's been 20 years since, it's, since the mission has been flying. 
And so there's, all, there's an unlikely chance that the, the, the spacecraft may get out of control. I mean, the mission control won't be able to control it. And that's why in order to prevent this unlikely possibility of the spacecraft crashing into one of these two moons, they have decided to uh, plunge it into the atmosphere of Saturn. And secondly, by making this or by deciding on this maneuver, they will be able to, uh, you know, reveal more mysteries about Saturn itself as it enters the atmosphere. So who knows, we might find something even more astounding than what we know so far. Thank you, Dan. We're going to move on now to Test 24. Field Ready is a small NGO, but it's helping to solve the world's greatest humanitarian challenges. How so? By bringing 3D printers to disaster-stricken areas to help create much-needed supplies. Well, for more on this, let's turn to Field Ready co-founder Dara Dots in London. Thanks for joining us here on Tech24. Thanks for having me. So tell us, how did you come up with the idea of creating this NGO? Well, um, for me, a personal story, before I met my co-founder, Eric James, it was really about um, when, I, when I went to Haiti. And I wanted to see what happened in like phase three of a disaster after all this aid went in, how, how, how much better was Haiti rebuilt. And when I got there, I was pretty shocked um, at the lack of, of access to things that people needed. Um, I was looking at different water supply, sanitation situations, and I kept seeing that they were dilapidated and falling apart, all for lack of one little part, like a screw or a washer. But what really got me going was a dear friend of mine who was a nurse there. And one night, she had no medical supplies left because no one was donating anymore. Um, she had to deliver five babies. And what that meant was that she, she needed to find something sterile to tie off their umbilical cords. So what she did is she took her last pair of latex gloves and that were sterile, and she cut the fingers off of them to then tie off the umbilical cords for the infants, which is an, a great hack because it prevents ne neonatal sepsis. But that also means that it put her own life in danger because the next four women um, were potentially HIV positive. And when I heard this and it sunk in, I got really angry and frustrated. And I said, this is just, this is just ridiculous. This has to stop. And so the next time I had power and internet, I actually made a call out on uh, social media to see if anyone had an old, like an old 3D printer I could use because I, was, I thought I could definitely 3D print those umbilical cord clamps. And it turns out that set us on this crazy journey of learning how to make on demand um, as people need things in crisis zones. And then I met Eric and it just kind of went from there. And now the idea here is to transform the way the world responds to humanitarian crises. What are the challenges that you're trying to overcome with technology? The biggest challenges right now that we're working on is really about basically supply chain. Um, many times, it can take anywhere from months to years to get supplies to the people that need it. And I mean, 60 to 70% of aid is actually spent just simply on logistics. And so what we're really focusing on is actually making it in the field with the people who need it. So we get people exactly what they need, exactly when they need it, and exactly where they need it. Um, and we do that through co-creation and creating a sense of agency with the affected populations so they have a say in what their future is. Um, and we also teach them how to use the tools so they have more um, livelihood experience, um, new skill sets, and they're more prepared for when the next disaster strikes. And now let's talk about what lies ahead. What other technologies would you like to integrate in your future deployments? Well, currently we're using, as you know, 3D printers, but we're also using that combined with old technology. So we do metal cast, we make the molds with 3D printers, and then we actually use metal casting um, in Nepal to create metal parts very rapidly. Um, for things that are needed. So we've been doing that. We can do that turnaround in about two to three days, which is really rapid for metal work. Um, but in that regard, what I'm most excited about as we have exponential technologies, um, the, the, you know, the more we, we produce them, the cheaper the price comes down. And so I think right now I'm personally most excited about having a, 3D print, a metal 3D printer so that we can actually make car parts on demand when cars break down in the field um, in crisis zones so we can get people the help they need much quicker. Well, thank you so much, Dara Dots. Thank you for having me. That was the co-founder of the NGO Field Ready. And we happen to have here on set some of the objects that were 3D printed on the field. Dan, this is the uh, umbilical cord clamp that uh, Dara, Dara was talking about. That's right. This, there was a pressing need for this clamp in Haiti, as Dara mentioned. And you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And so Field Ready found a very inexpensive and a very novel solution 
by using plastic and 3D printing and they prototyped it very rapidly and produced these clamps. Uh, in Nepal, following the earthquake, there was, as we saw, widespread damage, including damage to buildings, uh, medical facilities. And in one such hospital that FieldReady was uh, working with, they found that just for want of a connector, there was no electricity in the, in the premises. Uh, now, the, importing the entire power unit would have taken a lot of time and would have taken a lot of, uh, cost a lot of money as well. So what they did was they again found a very simple solution using 3D printing uh, and plastic materials. They printed this connector and they just plugged in the or made it possible for the uh, power to be restored in that building. So this Without was an, changing everything. Absolutely. It's an expensive, inexpensive solution. And this is again uh, another example of uh, rapid prototyping and quick manufacturing using 3D printing and plastic. So this is a, a phytoscope and it was also, uh, there was also need for it in Nepal following the earthquake and that's what the field really did. It's a fascinating project. Thank you so much, Dan and Jay Kadokar. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. Thanks for watching and do stay with us here on France 24.